Now, before before we get started for the Q and A session, yes, um, the the questions will be coming up on the chat box, right? Yeah, chat box, chat box or Q and A, preferably in Q and A. Okay, yeah. So I will go through the chat box, and uh, I will ask the questions from each of the speakers at the end of their talk. Yes. Correct. Yes, Chandra, but preferably Q&A, so you can announce at the beginning that all the questions to be entered in Q&A. It becomes easier if okay. most of the questions are in one, uh, you know, uh, area. So Q&A is a separate area from chat box? Yes. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, okay. so it becomes easier yeah. for you to check. So where do I... Do I see a Q&A on my screen? Oh yeah, I do see a Q&A on my screen. Okay. Yes. I didn't realize Q&A is separate from chat box. Yes. Okay, so I will check both. Yes. And, um, and uh, it, does each speaker have a clock that, that to remind them whether the time is up or time is getting close? Oh, we have not put. You don't have a clock, okay. Well, our speakers are good. They will stop yeah. right on time. Yeah, I know. Hi, Marco. Hi, hi, Marco. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I've worn a tie in over a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I was debating too, then I decided to wear this. Okay, good. Uh, You're looking good, I Sanjay. I almost forgot how to put it on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> ID. Uh, ID. Shall we start the uh, video of uh, uh, overall overview of the program? Then how, uh, Kavita, Kavita, how many people have checked in? Okay. Is that a way to find out? Yes. There are twenty-one people. Okay. Sounds good. Anytime you want to get started, please go ahead. We'll start now. Greetings to all from Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, India. Myself, Dr. Kavita Saro, Professor and Head, Department of Infectious Diseases at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and Organizing Chairperson, have the pleasure to invite all of you to the second day of an international conference on combating antimicrobial resistance. We are hosting this conference in observance of World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. This program is organized by Department of Infectious Disease, Kasturba Medical College, Manipal, and in Division of Infectious Diseases, Wayne State University, Michigan. Overarching theme of World Antimicrobial Awareness Week is Antimicrobials Handle with Care. This year's theme is Spread Awareness, Stop Resistance. Antimicrobials are precious resource and they have to be protected at all costs. In fact, protecting 
the existing antimicrobials in human and animal health is one of the strategic objectives of global action plan to prevent antimicrobial resistance i have the pleasure of introducing my co-chair dr pranatharthi chandrashekar chief of division of infectious diseases at wayne state university michigan usa he is known as the father of infectious disease in india because of his instrumental work establishing and facilitating clinical infectious disease society of india dr chandrashekar is passionate about promoting the educational field of infectious diseases in india he has been honored with 2018 ambassador award by the wayne state university school of medicine for his contribution towards infectious diseases in india Dr Chandrashekar has published 192 articles in various peer reviewed journals and 21 book chapters his major interests include management of infections in compromised hosts particularly those undergoing cancer therapy and stem cell transplantation i am proud to say that dr chandrashekar serves as adjunct professor in the department of infectious disease at kmc manipur i request dr chandra to take over for further proceedings over to you chandra thank you thank you kavita uh can you hear me yes chandra we can very good thank you uh good evening everyone uh it's about 7 am in detroit where i am sitting it's a pleasure to participate in this uh, uh antimicrobial awareness week conference appropriately so as the world celebrates this antibiotic awareness week thank you for giving us this opportunity to participate in this manipal program uh, we're very happy now antibiotics as you know have been around for a long time and in the three prong attack of infections first clean water supply came in over a century ago that substantially reduced the infections around the world and then came the vaccines and then came the antibiotics so these are three important instruments in our armamentarium against infections and we have done extraordinarily well and most recently uh, the vaccine against the sars cov2 antibiotics however have a limited lifespan depending upon how we use them they are notorious as you misuse them abuse them there would be resistance developing and more importantly microbial uh, microbiome alteration in the gi tract so we owe a responsibility we carry a responsibility with us in careful judicious use of antibiotics so towards this end we celebrate this week and i thought of three different areas to present at this conference the first area these are all three are less commonly talked about areas in the field of antimicrobial resistance first is fungal infections so dr sanjay ravankar is going to be talking to us about fungal resistance in in the clinical world primarily about candida we talk a lot about gram negative bacterial resistance gram positive bacterial resistance but we don't speak much about fungal resistance not that it is not there it is certainly prevalent people are not studying it as well as they should and increase awareness among the public and particularly among the infectious disease subspecialists so i have the pleasure of introducing dr sanjay ravankar to address the issue of uh, uh, anti fungal resistance in in the context of antimicrobial stewardship uh, could i have uh, his first introductory slide please great thank you so as you can see is a professor of medicine uh, he is the fellowship program director in the division of uh, infectious diseases at wayne state university michigan his areas of interest include stem cell and organ transplant related infections as well as infections in neutropenic patients uh, he has expertise in diagnosing and treating fungal infections and his lab is involved in evaluating new drugs for fungus that are difficult to treat 
Dr. Ravanka also is also involved in clinical studies of new therapies for fungal infections and other infections seen in cancer patients. He also heads our infection control department at the Kamanos Cancer Center. He has over 100 articles to his credit in various journals. Sanjay, please go ahead. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much, Chandra and uh, Kavita, for inviting me to speak here today at uh, this really important conference on a topic that's really uh, critical to our mission uh, in infectious disease. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> I was asked to talk about uh, drug resistance, uh, antifungal drug resistance, and within the context of stewardship. And so what I thought I'd do is Uh, just as an outline, talk about, in general, how antifungals have developed in Canada and how we are using them, and how this use over the last really many years has impacted the issue of drug resistance, particularly in Canada, which really is the main fungal infection that we treat and is responsible for really most of the antifungals that we use as well. And how that leads, uh, the last kind of third of my talk, is how that leads to the concept or issue of antifungal stewardship, which is probably not as gotten as much attention as it deserves, and some of the approaches to antifungal stewardship and then some future directions uh, as we go uh, forward. So, just briefly, I'm not going to go into this in some detail, but uh, candid species are really increasing causes of bloodstream infections uh, really throughout the world, particularly the U.S. Uh, many species cause disease. We'll touch on some of the most important ones. In contrast, other fungal infections, they're considered a normal flora of the GI tract, and the infection is really considered from um, the patient's endogenous flora. And the primary host defense is really an intact skin and mucosa. So if you have that, it's very unlikely for you to get invasive Canada infections. But unfortunately, during uh, medical care, we, if we will break that contact skin mucosa. So the risk factors for invasive disease are often intravenous catheters, uh, which are very common, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, neutropenia, GI surgery, uh, TPN, and steroids. So the costs in general of candidemia are really huge. And this is uh, from an older study, but really kind of reviewed in general the cost per patient, about $34,000 to $44,000 per patient, at least in the U.S., over $200 million a year. Length of stay is increased by 21 days, which is enormous, and the attributable mortality is about 38%, and that really hasn't changed very much, as uh, we'll see. So clinical Canada species, the most common is Canada albicans. As you know, it's most common. It's most susceptible in general. Uh, Canada Gabrata, which we'll talk about, is increasing incidence and reduced susceptibility to fluconazole. Canada Parapsilosis, often associated with central lines, TPN, and skin colonization of healthcare workers' hands. Canada Tropicalis, which is more common in other parts of the world, uh, also associated with neutropenia and cancer patients. And then Canada Cruzii, which is generally considered resistant to fluconazole. So epidemiology of candidemia has really changed dramatically in the last couple decades, to the point where non albican species now account for about 50% or more cases of candidemia in most studies, uh, certainly in the United States. Previously, it was about a third or so. And as I'll show you, this has really been associated with the broad use of fluconazole. Other factors certainly come into play as an increase in immunocompromised patients, um, but this introduction of fluconazole, which is really a game-changing event in the history of antifungal therapy. In about 1990, uh, this is a study done many, several, many years ago that showed that the incidence of albicans dropped substantially in hematologic malignancy patients once fluconazole was used as prevention. And you can see the graph here for uh, Canada albicans dropped substantially within just a couple of years. 
And the rise of Tanner Cruzia, which is inherently resistant to Fuconzo, was also noted slightly at that time. So this was continued in further studies that decline in the instance of Canada albicans because of really a, the white species Fuconzo. Then the increase you'll notice here, I'll fo you focus on the graph of Canada gabrata. This has increased steadily during that time. And so this is a species that is often less susceptible and can become resistant uh, to, can to fluconazole quite easily. So this is a complicated slide, but I just want to focus on a few areas. This is different types of patients that we see that can get candidemia. And I'll focus on kind of the baseline here of general medicine, where albicans is the most common, labrata is less common, and then cruzia here in blue is very uncommon. But in other populations, such as stem cell transplants, hematologic malignancies and solid organ transplants, these more resistant or, or, uh, species are more common. So you can see here, here, and then much more common for cruzia here. And this is really a direct result of the exposure of these patients to azoles, particularly to conzo over the years. So just briefly touch on olds, we'll discuss this more later, but fluconazole <clears throat> resistance, the primary players uh, one is albicans, just because it's so common. It's usually highly susceptible, but resistance can occur in AIDS patients with thrush. It's relatively uncommon in other settings, um, even in candidemia, generally uncommon, but maybe increasing. Canada glabrata, MIC is usually variable, but usually not highly susceptible. Most MIC is usually elevated. And then high level resistance is about 5 to 10%. And then the really concerning issue is that the kind of candidate resistance is emerging. And these isolates are what we would call MDR isolates for Canada, which is a kind of a term that didn't exist 10 years ago, but it is becoming more common now. And then finally, as I mentioned, Cruzia has generally innate resistance uh, to fluconazole. So some of the issues I'm talking about uh, are often different in different parts of the world. So the epidemiology of candidemia is not the same everywhere. So for example, in an Indian ICU study, 27 ICUs from uh, 2011 to 2012, 1,400 candemia cases. Canada's tropicalis actually turned out to be the most common isolate. Albicans was 21%, Glavada only 7%, and Canada RS was about 5%. We'll talk about this one a little bit later. Azole resistance was about 12%, MDR resistance 2%, and 30-day trivial mortality 20%. In Brazil, similarly, Canada tropicalis is a very common isolate as well. Uh, similar to uh, other parts of the country, and the crude mortality is, was actually quite high in this study. So just a word about diagnosis. Um, you might wonder how that relates to resistance, but it turns out that how, we're, how we detect Canada and how early we can detect it is really important in, in, in management and in, in rational use of antifungal. So, Canada generally goes well in routine blood cultures when it grows. Unfortunately, it's only about 50%, 50 to 70% sensitive in invasive candidiasis. Positive blood cultures are always significant. So because of this lack of sensitivity of traditional blood cultures, many sites are turning to non-culture methods, which are more sensitive, such as the beta-glucan, which is about 80% sensitive overall, and then T2 Canada, which is a magnetic resonance-based detection system that many places are starting to have, which is even more sensitive, 90%, and then PCR, which is also similarly 90% sensitive. In the US, these two are FDA approved and widely available. PCR is used, but not FDA approved here. I'll just point out that the T2 Canada method has a very high specificity, so a negative predictive value is very, very good for this test. Uh, it is not as widely available because the instrument is quite expensive. Uh, just before talking about the different drugs, uh, there are many different options we have for treating candida infections. The primary ones, as you uh, might have guessed, are acanacandins and azoles, particularly fluconazole. Um, and the treatment has changed in the last several years. So now acanacandins um, are often the first choice, particularly in critically ill patients, because of their cytal activity and broad spectrum of activity. Fluconazole remains a workhorse, if you will, for treating candida infections, particularly in stable patients. 
and those that are felt to have a low risk of resistance. And is often used in step-down therapy after five to seven days of that kind of tendon, and this strategy has been proven effective. Second-line therapy, voriconazole and amphotericin B, uh, at least in the United States, are not used nearly as often. <clears throat> so a couple of the issues recently that have pointed toward an increased risk or increased use of uh, the antifungals is studies that really show that the sooner you start antifungals for candidemia or basic candidiasis, the better the outcomes. So this is patients who are started on the day of culture, meaning they were suspected early and started on therapy, mortality is 15%, and it just increases the more you delay. So oftentimes you may not get results on day two or day three, your mortality rate has already increased to 40%. And so the impetus to start therapy earlier is, is adding pressure to use antifungals. And this interesting study more recently shows that the in-hospital mortality seems to be lower in the acanopandin era, pointing to the efficacy of acanopandin for treating candidemia, and additionally offering pressure to use the, these drugs, which are effective more and more for these patients. So if that wasn't enough in putting pressure to use uh, antifungals earlier, we are now seeing data that predicting candidiasis in the ICU and treating even empiric therapy may also be beneficial. So invasive disease, as I mentioned, is difficult to diagnose. There are various algorithms for predicting risk, which I won't go into. Clinical trials are complex. We've actually participated in both empiric and preemptive therapy and prophylaxis trials here at Wayne State. And I will just say they're very difficult to, uh, to conduct. The goal is reduction in mortality, which so far has been elusive. We've not been able to really affect mortality in, in treating patients empirically. But this is the general idea. So patients, particularly in the ICU that are very high risk in Canada, you can see it here that pre-ICU risk is low, uh, depending on their condition. And then once they enter the ICU, they develop, uh, they may be intubated, they have central lines, they often get broad spectrum antibiotics. And then they develop Canada colonization that may increase with these risk factors. And then the longer they stay in the ICU, so let's say after day five, the risk of Canada infection really increases. So you will have what's called intra-abdominal candidiasis, which is difficult to detect in early, and then that may predict, progress to candidemia. And this is the area where we might prescribe uh, systemic antifungal therapy. So the IDSC guidelines have actually addressed this. So the issue of empiric therapy, they feel that empiric therapy should be started as soon as possible in patients who have risk factors in the ICU and who have clinical signs of septic shock. Keep in mind, this is patients who have not had a positive culture. So they're merely at risk, but they're on antibiotics, uh, they're very sick, and they're at uh, risk rate of uh, systemic candidiasis. So empiric therapy should be started, strong evidence, a strong recommendation, moderate quality. Recommend duration therapy uh, in those who approve is two weeks. If they don't have clinical response and a negative non-culture assay, consider stopping at the therapy. And then going beyond that is Canada prophylaxis. This is a relatively recent uh, concept, but this has made it into the guidelines. So fluconazole could be used in high-risk patients with adult ICUs with a high rate, over 5% of base candidiasis. This is a weak recommendation, but uh, there are institutions that are seeing this and are using this as a strategy. An alternative is using a kind of candid as prophylaxis, any one of the kind of candids. Again, weak recommendation, low quality of evidence, but given the number of patients at risk, this is something that is being considered. So you can imagine with all of these different indications for use of antifungals, we really need to be think carefully about using them and this has led to a real issue in resistance, and it's even made it onto the CDC website as identifying fluconazole resistant Canada as an important threat in the United States, certainly, and likely around the world, where they feel 46,000 Canada infections a year, 3,400 resistant ones, and 220 deaths attributed to these resistant uh, Canada infections. So before we get into talking much about resistance, we do need to touch a little bit about susceptibility testing for antifungals, which is 
really lagged behind antibacterial susceptibility testing. This was only standardized for Canada in 1997 by the NCTLS, now called the CLSI, and this was revised in 2008. So this is relatively recent. We just haven't had much standardized antifungal testing in this setting. Initially, it's based on thrush isolates, and this is revised with data on canademia. And the current breakpoints are really based on what's called the epidemiological cutoff values and clinical and pharmacokinetic data. And they're often species specific, but they're, the data is still relatively limited. We don't have data on all the antifungals for all the common uh, Canada species, even to this day. It's difficult to develop that data. So when to perform susceptibility testing, uh, in the latest iteration of the IDSA guidelines, they recommend all isolates that have invasive, that cause invasive disease should be tested to at least fluconazole uh, and potentially kind of candidates if there's concern for resistance. And certainly if there's clinical failure to use, to test for amphotericin B5, that's the fluconazole, voriconazole, and then kind of um, Any unusual species and a variety of validated methods are available in the United States. CLSI is the standard, but Certainly, UCAST and the European uh, system and other methods uh, such as e-test have been validated and can be used. So I want to focus on resistance mechanisms for azole because those are the most common. Uh, we know quite a bit about azole resistance. Uh, one mechanism is altered target enzyme c 14 methylase. Another is increased target enzyme expression. And then finally, the major player is really efflux pumps which alter the cell permeability. So there's two types. One is MDR, or what's called major facilitator transporters, which provide low level resistance, and then AT binding cassette transporters, which provide high level azole resistance. And this was really illustrated in a seminal study <coughs> by Ted White uh, uh, many years ago. And this was actually from my institution, uh, where I did my fellowship, uh, of 17 serial isogenic candid alpha against isolates from one patient over two years that had recurrent episodes where we used to treat them with fluconazole and had increasing MICs to fluconazole and that correlated with clinical resistance. This is really the first time it showed that, that we can show that these mechanisms correlate to actual clinical resistance in patients. And in this patient, there was sequential increase in mRNA for MDR1, uh, the D14 methylase, and CDR correlating with rising MICs. And this is, uh, this is kind of a busy graph here, but I want you to focus on what the, air, uh, the stars are so that the bottom star is the dose of fluconazole that was used, so 100, 200, 400, and 800 milligrams. And you can see how this directly correlates with the MIC to fluconazole here as being near 0.25 at the beginning. And then over multiple courses of therapy, you can see that there was an increase in this MDR mRNA here, which caused a rise in MIC to about eight. And then that persisted for, for a long period of time over many episodes and then increase in ERG-11 mRNA causing uh, rise in the, in, the, in the number of copies. And then finally, the resistance to uh, CDR or the multidrug transporter caused uh, complete resistance to a fluconazole over the, in the last course of the, this patient's uh, course of treatment. And so this showed uh, really definitively that this happens. It can happen in a single patient and multiple uh, mechanisms over time, and this just isolates how difficult it is to manage these patients once they become resistant. So what about issues of antifungal resistance in India? This was a very nice review of over 11,000 isolates of Canada uh, from all parts of India that was recently published, and it showed that the distribution of species was uh, Relatively typical for what we see in India, Canada albicans is the most common, but still only about 38%. Canada tropicalis, that's most likely. Canada gabbrata, 12%. Canada auris, interestingly, is only 1%, which is good, but this is, this is actually, uh, this review goes back about 40 years. So uh, this has not been a more, there's only been a more recent phenomenon of uh, Canada. Fluconazole so resistance, unfortunately, is common, about 22% overall in these isolates. Canada Gravata, 34%, Tropical 17 Even Canada Albicans had 15% resistance, and Canada RS is 41%. So this is really concerning for the amount of resistance that we're seeing now uh, in India. And also concerning is the kind of canon resistance. 
these are often sometimes the last line of effective therapy for invasive candidiasis, and the mechanism is alteration of the target enzyme FKS1, and the candidate, the rates of resistance are lower, but they're concerning. Glabrata 68%, uh, 6 to 8%, Canada Tropicalis 2 to 3%, and then Albicans 1 to 6% as well, and Aurus about 6%. So I want to uh, spend a couple of slides on Canada Aurus. This is kind of the harbinger of antifungal drug resistance that we can see uh, or have been seeing in the last several years that's really got people concerned throughout the world and in particular in the United States. This was first isolated in 2009 from the ear of a patient in Japan, hence the name Aurus. There have been relatively few cases of human infection until about 2015 when there were relatively suddenly multiple reports of cases and outbreaks often associated with candidemia. This is an emerging Canada species seen in several regions worldwide. And in recent studies in India, about five to 30% is candidemia in India, which is really concerning. That's, a, that's an extraordinarily high amount of uh, isolates in certain institutions in, in India. Uh, risk factors uh, are typical to what we think for invasive candidiasis, diabetes, malignancy, kidney disease, broad spectrum antibiotics, surgery, central line certainly, and intensive care units. So this is just kind of a map, I'll just show you where we are in the United States. Fortunately, we are seeing this, but it is in pockets, if you will, throughout the country. So these areas in red are high incidences, New York, Illinois, Florida, and California. Fortunately, we're in Michigan, we only have one case of Canada R so far in the state of Michigan and that was a non-invasive case, fortunately, and we are all on the lookout for it and being, trying to be very cautious uh, once we do see it. This is a world map for Canada Aris. This is spread throughout, uh, you know, essentially all developing countries um, and rates are, are, are high in, in different areas of the country, uh, different areas of the world, uh, especially in India, where you can also see this uh, resistant organism. The challenge of Canada Aris is that it is difficult to identify routine methods. It's often misidentified as Canada hemolonii, Canada pomata, Canada sake, or rotatoria even. The best way of diagnosis was MOLDI-TOF, which is a more recent but extensive diagnostic test with updated databases that we do have here. Uh, fortunately, we've not seen it. There are two real concerns with Canada RS, and one that it is that it is easily transmitted between patients. So it often contaminates healthcare environments, for example, an outbreak in the London hospital is found to be spread by reusable temperature probes, uh, and that was difficult to control. Uh, in general, it's difficult to eradicate from the environment. Bleach products are recommended for cleaning of rooms similar to C. difficile, and that's why it's been such a challenge to control it when it, when it does produce outbreaks. And the other reason is that it's resistant. Um, this is really the first new Canada species that, that has been seen on the horizon that has come into the area new drug resistant. Uh, over 90% of isolates are resistant to Clamazole, certainly in the United States, about 30% are resistant to amphotericin B, and up to 7 to 15% are resistant to kind of candids, which are first-line drugs for candidemia here. Some isolates have been found to be resistant to all three classes of antifungals, which is unprecedented for candidate species. The mortality rate is also high at 30%. So the CDC has recommended a high suspicion in cases of unusual species or unidentified species. Um, here in the US, kind of candidates are still recommended as first line therapy because the rate of resistance in the isolates here is still, low, is still low. However, contact precautions are recommended, which is again, unprecedented for Canada infections. And here we are required to report all cases to the state health department because we want to really uh, be careful and prevent the spread of this very uh, dangerous resistant uh, new cannabis species. So with all that in background, and I can hope you, uh, I've, I've convinced you that uh, Canada and drug resistant Canada is becoming a real important and serious issue uh, in clinical practice. Where do we go from here? How do we combat this resistance and what can we do to uh, improve this uh, situation. Well, as uh, you'll see from other talks later, uh, in particular, uh, uh, Marco Scipioni, who talked about uh, stewardship as well, antimicrobial stewardship is really what we need to do. And that's 
That's something that Dr. Chandra has been really been championing for champion championing for many years, uh, particularly in India, and that's to uh, where the goal is to optimize clinical outcomes by appropriate prescribing the antimicrobials in order to limit emergence of drug resistance, adverse effects, and healthcare costs. That's a big goal, um, and that's a broad overview. But I want to focus on antifungal stewardship and how that may and how that specifically may be uh, something to do to improve the situation of uh, antifungal drug resistance. In contrast to antimicrobial stewardship, this is a relatively emerging field. The optimal method of measuring antifungal prescribing has really not been established. And measuring clinical outcomes are important, but they're difficult because the incidence of uh, IFIs are lower. Um, they're more difficult to diagnose, as I mentioned, for Canada. And mortality and adverse effects of antifungals are also less common and often difficult to quantify. So why is it important? Uh, I hope I've already just, uh, convinced you that earlier, but certainly about 3% of hospital admissions and about 8% of ICU admissions are associated with antifungal prescription. So it's not a small number. Uh, and one study suggested that about 30 to 50% of antifungal prescriptions may be inappropriate, which is really a staggering number. And finally, that antifungals are often very expensive, especially the antifungals that we are using for treat these critically ill patients in the ICU, kind of candin, uh, occasionally other azoles such as boriconazole, uh, they're very expensive. Uh, and this is a, an increasing problem. So the mycosis study group, <coughs> uh, international group uh, based in the United States, has made some recommendations recently on how to approach antifungal stewardship. So first is to get engagement of senior management. Uh, you really need to have uh, engagement of the seniors, ma management of the hospital and the institution to make this a priority. To have core members of the group include ID physicians and ID trained pharmacists. Engage clinical specialists from high prescribing specialties such as hematology and oncology. Um, have available broad diagnostic testing for Canada and aspergillus. If you don't diagnose these patients early, it's gonna be difficult to manage uh, them appropriately. Targeted educational programs to physicians and other providers, and improve the management of uh, innovation of fungal infections by using ID consultation and care pathways where the treatment of these is in a protocol and is standardized. And finally, to improve routine surveillance and susceptibility testing of IFI and monitor antifungal use with feedback to prescribers. So, this has actually been studied in a number of different articles. So in a review of 13 studies, they looked at different interventions specifically for antifungal stewardship. And they looked at care bundles, pharmacist recommendations, diagnostic tool development, and they found that the appropriate antifungal choice improved in two out of two studies with the inventor intervention, time to the therapy improved in two out of four, and the antifungal consumption was decreased in seven out of eight studies with these interventions. Clinical outcomes, however, were more, more difficult, mortality and overall length of stay were not changed. <clears throat> so a couple of points that can be made, serum beta glucan testing to aid in reducing the empiric antifungal therapy in the ICU. And when you use this as a surrogate marker, you can reduce the duration of antifungal use. Although if you don't test frequently enough, you don't really use the, use, reduce the overall use of iconoplasty. In immunocompromised populations, uh, this is importantly important in cancer centers, given the high rates of IFI, where antifungal use is often inappropriate. You need to develop institutional guidelines based on risk stratification of patient-specific factors, and that's really critical to uh, appropriately use antifungals. And the last point I'd, I'd like to make is the duration of invasive mold infection treatment. I think this is a particular challenge that we find when we were out in our cancer center, is that for even a compromised patients, particularly those uh, receiving therapy for leukemia or stem cell transplantation, when they're diagnosed with antifungal uh, or mold infection, they are often given therapy for months because of their, uh, because their immunocompromised or immunosuppression is often continued for that long also. So this is a real challenge in, in addressing an antifungal stewardship. This the ther duration of therapy is not standardized and it's often challenging to define for stewardship. And then multiple factors are considered with really little data. 
And there's no easy answers to uh, reducing that therapy. So in the end, in order to uh, achieve optimal patient care, you really need to ba balance clinical judgment for the patient, as well as uh, consideration of antifungal stewardship. And that is often difficult to balance. So future directions, uh, standardizing assessment and protocols, um, improved rapid diagnostics, such as beta-glucan and T2 Canada, prospective studies of clinical outcome, more widespread susceptibility testing in each individual hospital, and then developing guidelines based on specific patient populations. Uh, these are all challenges that we need to address uh, going forward in order to improve antifungal stewardship. So in summary, uh, I'll just say that the antifungal stewardship is becoming recognized as an important component of antibiotic stewardship. Uh, as you can see, antifungal drug resistance has been increasing over the last decades. Uh, there are unique challenges in this setting with many issues to address, as I mentioned, but there are really significant potential benefits of reduced cost and re decreased resistance uh, moving forward. And I'll stop there and I'll take any questions. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, those are important points uh, that Dr. Ravanka was making about uh, fungal resistance, particularly in India, with a high prevalence of azole resistance, even in Candida albicans, a high prevalence of Candida auris in various parts of the country, uh, reminds us to use these drugs with a great deal of caution, appropriate indications, minimal effective dose for the minimum possible duration. And these are all pr basic principles of antimicrobial stewardship. As for questions uh, for the speaker, uh, I see uh, in the Q&A, if you have any questions, please type out in the Q&A side. Uh, Sanjay, you want to tackle this. Uh, somebody with candiduria and candidemia, urinary tract focus, uh, recognizing candines don't get into the urine very well. How do we tackle this problem? Or do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that, that is a, a, a real challenge for those species that are not susceptible to fluconazole. So for candiduria, where you feel you need to be treated, and many times you don't need to treat candiduria, but when you see it in conjunction with invasive candidiasis and you think that may be a source, if it's an organism like Candida glabrata, there are really few effective therapies for treating candiduria. There are data to suggest that if you are treating a primary kidney infection, such, such as pyelonephritis, uh, so it's a tissue kidney infection, a kind of candidate may be effective in that setting when you're targeting the kidney specifically. However, if you're trying to find drugs that get into the urine itself, you're really very limited. Uh, and the only real options are fluconazole and amphotericin B. Um, there is a little bit of data with flucytosine, but as a single agent, that's not recommended because of the high rate of resistance that develops in using that as, a, as monotherapy. So uh, it is a challenge. We don't have really good options for resistant organisms that are, resi that are uh, fluconazole resistant, uh, other than amphotericin B, unfortunately. Uh, amphotericin B bladder wash may be another option um, in, in patients that are maybe limited to the to the to the urine, but when you're dealing with systemic and urine, um, it, it's a challenge. Okay, let's uh, uh, you know, Candida auris is a, a big issue. I would like to ask Kavita or uh, Morali there in the group about Candida auris in India and uh, how big a problem. How are the institutions uh, tackling this problem? Kavita, would you uh, comment on uh, ORIS uh, at your place and in general in various large institutions in India? Uh, in our institution, it is a, a sporadic problem. It is a, uh, not as much as a challenge, but yes, if it is a drug resistant, uh, then uh, you know it's a universal problem to treat candida ORIS whenever there's resistance. But also, I guess, uh, the identification is also an issue. Uh, 
the it might be uh, from the automated systems it might be read wrongly so that is also a challenge of diagnosis of candida auris uh, so verma can uh, go ahead and give his comments uh, let me also ask you about um, the cost of these drugs in the Indian setting. Uh, for example, lipid formulations of amphotericin B could be very, very expensive. Uh, uh, um, even echinocandins could be fairly expensive. Or the newer azoles like isovaconazole could be expensive. Uh, how do you deal with this in, the, in a practical situation? Yeah, so uh, treatment of fungal infections is really difficult. One is because of the cost involved. Um, so many of the patients, when uh, liposomal amphotericin is indicated, we, we may not be able to give liposomal amphotericin. Uh, on the other hand, we have great experience with uh, deoxycholate amphotericin. Uh, most of the patients receive deoxycholate amphotericin and uh, we are quite uh, used to managing those patients. Um, yeah, also the cost of echinocandine is huge. Uh, we, we don't get uh, isovaconazole here in our place uh, as much. Maybe it is available in other parts of India, but uh, most of the public uh, health sector, uh, it will be very difficult. And these antifungal costly medicines, mostly they are prescribed in the private sector. Okay, thank you. Do, one last question before we go back to Sanjay. Do you have um, aspergillus uh, azole resistance? Kavita? Mostly they have been sensitive to oriconazole. Uh, we have been able to treat with oriconazole, itroconazole. Yeah, I, I have not seen no. much azole resistance in aspergillus. Good. Good, because you know, in, in Europe, certain places are describing as much as five to 10% of boriconazole resistance in Aspergillus fumigatus. So the European guidelines have changed accordingly. Fortunately, in the US, we don't see that much azole resistance in Aspergillus. So I was just curious, is it being looked at in India? Do we have any data? Okay, uh, Sanjay, let's go back to you, Sanjay. Uh, uh, do you have any uh, final comments before we move to the next speaker, Sanjay? No, uh, just that uh, uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this really important issue. I, I think uh, this has really not gotten much attention. Um, and in our, I'll just mention in our institution, um, Dr. Chopra is talking a bit later, but She's the head of the Endocrine Stewardship Committee here, and we do monitor antifungal drug use here. We do have criteria for using, particularly these uh, more extensive agents, the kind of candidates sort of like liposomal amphotericin B, and uh, we are monitoring that. And I think it's an important issue that you know really every institution should uh, be concerned about because this issue of resistance is creeping up. Uh, it really was not much of an issue, let's say 20 years ago, but now I think it's pretty widespread and um, uh, it, it, everyone needs to be pay attention to it uh, going forward. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay, for your time and for your contribution. Let's uh, move on with our next uh, talk. Next one is uh, somewhat uh, revolutionary for the Indian audience. Uh, uh, speaker is Dr. Marco Scipioni. Uh, Marco is a clinical pharmacist. For, as you can see on the slide, he's a clinical pharmacy specialist in infectious disease. He's the residency program director for the PG year two infectious diseases residency program at the Detroit Medical Center. He's also adjunct faculty at the Eugene Applebaum College of... Could I have the slide back, please? Okay, uh, it shows Sanjay Ravankar on the screen. Uh, could I have, okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, Dr. Scipioni is board certified in pharmacotherapy with added qualifications in infectious diseases. His research interests in antimicrobial resistance and stewardship has published several papers in various journals, presented over 30 abstracts at various national pharmacy and ID conference. The reason why I said this is revolutionary is he is a clinical pharmacist. You seldom see a clinical pharmacist giving a lecture in an infectious diseases conference anywhere in India. In the United States, we have a category of people called clinical pharmacists. They participate in the ward rounds in order to advise the infectious diseases team with good stewardship. Whether it's the antibiotic is appropriate, what should be the dose, what should be the duration, what would be the drug interactions with other drugs the patient might be receiving. Clinical pharmacists play an invaluable role in appropriate use of antimicrobials, particularly in the hospital setting. I would very much like to see something similar come up in the Indian hospitals as well. So to introduce this concept, I thought we will ask Dr. Marco, Marco Cipioni to talk about what he does in his daily life at work. So to, to make you aware that there is such a category of individuals making extremely valuable contribution in appropriate use of antimicrobials in hospitals. Uh, Marco, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. I'm gonna try and share my screen now. Uh, hopefully this works. Uh, We can see it, but you have to put it in slide mode. Okay. There you go. That looks better. Not yet. Okay, yes, it's in the slideshow. Good. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk today about the evolving role of clinical pharmacy as a integral part of antimicrobial stewardship. I want to just point out that I have no disclosures. Um, and the objectives of my talk is to outline a brief history of antimicrobial stewardship within the United States, uh, review the evolving role of clinical pharmacists within antimicrobial stewardship as we have come a long way, and then to discuss the potential future um, within antimicrobial stewardship. And so when antibiotics were introduced, in the, you know, in the 1940s and 1950s with the sulfonamides and the penicillins, immediately we started to see antimicrobial resistance. And so with this, people started to discuss how do we prevent this resistance from occurring? And in the 1950s, it was identified that antibiotic overuse was linked with the hastening of this resistance. And this increased resistance was associated with increased mortality. In the 60s, it was, you know, tried to um, prevent this from happening. And there were a lot of um, ID physicians out of, out of the US trying to educate providers. Um, and education was introduced as a method to persuade physicians to refrain from overprescribing antibiotics, which were life-saving drugs and are still life-saving drugs. Um, but this really didn't have any effect on the actual overall use of, of antimicrobials in the United States and, and in Europe. And in the 70s, it was noted that the overall incidence of hospital infections did, did not actually decrease. The thought, with, the thought was that as more antibiotics were available, we're gonna actually see decreased infections that uh, patients need to get hospitalized for, but this, this didn't happen. And what they noticed in the 70s as well is that education was not having any impact on reducing the emergence of resistance. So in the 80s, there was a shift to a more kind of what we call activist role. They used um, kind of environmental activists as an example of how do we condemn the overuse of antibiotics. Um, and they started to, to shift from just education to condemning the use overuse of antibiotics and calling it wasteful and expensive. And there were infection control standards that were introduced that were 
introduced to evaluate and conduct surveillance for these hospital infections. And in the 80s, the IDSA issued specific recommendations on how to adopt restriction policies for the use of select antimicrobials, but there was no um, strong recommendations that all hospitals need to implement these types of strategies. And in the 90s, we started to see hospitals adopting specific programs as opposed to just education to try to regulate uh, antibiotic use in order to prevent the increasing resistance. And what we see in terms of the using the term antimicrobial stewardship, it was first, the first article that used the term antimicrobial stewardship was published in the United States in 1996. And it highlighted that antimicrobials should be considered a non-renewable resource. Since that time, you can see by this graph, looking at the number of publications utilizing the term antimicrobial stewardship, since the early or mid nineties to the, to the late to mid two thousands, you start to see an increase in the number of publications looking at antimicrobial stewardship. And over the last um, 10 years, and this is um, looking up to 2016, we can see that there are more and more publications um, looking at antimicrobial stewardship within the United States. One of the first studies that looked at antimicrobial stewardship and its impact on antibiotic use was a study published in 1997. And this was the first study that looked at the requirement for prior authorization for selected antimicrobials. And what the focus on for a lot of these early antimicrobial stewardship publications was on cost, because these antimicrobials were very expensive. And this study that looked at restricted policy for certain antibiotics, and the, the antibiotics are listed here that they had restricted. They looked at a similar time period in 1993 and 1994, and they found that when they restricted certain drugs, such as amikacin, estreonam, septazidine, ciprofloxacin, imipenem, and ticarcillin clavulonic acid, that they found that they reduced the antibiotic expenditure um, significantly from almost over $100,000 to $40,000. And what they found was that there was a slight increase in the use of non-restricted antibiotics, but this still didn't um, change the fact that they had an overall decrease in antimicrobial use in terms of cost. More importantly, what they found that with these restricted policies and prior authorization for selected antimicrobials, that there was no detrimental impact on survival. And so there was no poor clinical outcomes. And so they looked at all of those patients that had um, positive cultures before this prior authorization was implemented and after this um, stewardship program was implemented. And they found that the, um, that the mortality, the 30-day mortality was the same. The 30-day survival was the same. It was 79% before the prior authorization and about 75% after. So there was no impact necessarily detrimental impact on kind of restricting these antimicrobials, which has always been the concern when you delay antimicrobial therapy or restrict um, certain therapies. And so this was the first study that showed that an antimicrobial stewardship can result in a shift from expensive broad spectrum antibiotics to more narrow spectrum agents. There was a cost savings involved. They did see some increased susceptibilities and lower rates of infections caused by drug-resistant bacteria. And this has been shown with other um, studies as well. And most importantly, the ASPs or the antimicrobial stewardship programs did not compromise patient care or result in suboptimal antibiotic use. So after that original study was published in 1997, the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America and the IDSA um, published a guideline for the prevention of antimicrobial resistance in hospitals. And what they recommended in this guideline was to establish a system for monitoring bacterial resistance, establish practice guidelines, adopt recommendations, and utilize hospital committees. But they didn't specify any specific interventions that should be made in order to prevent antimicrobial resistance. So it was more of a monitoring um, system and providing guidelines. Since that time, um, about 10 years later, the IDSA and SHEA published specific guidelines for developing institutional antimicrobial stewardship. And these guidelines differed from the previous ones from 10 years ago in that they actually set out specific interventions 
and reporting that should be done in order to improve antimicrobial use and, and decrease resistance. And so in terms of interventions, the recommendations that they set forth from these original guidelines were to create programs to convert patients from IV therapy to oral therapy, um, create prospective audit and feedback programs, or to have a restricted policy with approval. Um, other interventions, including dose optimization, education, and facility-specific guidelines were also recommended. And then they recommended reporting on antibiotic costs using um, metrics such as the defined daily dose um, and creating a way to monitor antibiotic use. But this monitoring and reporting was really geared towards cost avoidance and looking at justifying the use of these antimicrobial or the implementation of these antimicrobial stewardship programs to decrease costs, to justify its use to the, to the higher ups within the healthcare system. And they were looking at process measures over outcome measures. Since that time in 2016, a new updated guideline has been um, published from IDSA and SHEA. And this guideline is slightly different in that it's, it's identifying which strategies have actually worked, which strategies can be implemented, and what kind of impact they can have. And along with the interventions and reporting that I mentioned on the previous slide, they also identified some other areas that can be improved upon or can be used to improve antimicrobial use. This includes kind of syndrome-based interventions, using prolonged infusions, dedicated pharmacokinetic services, rapid diagnostics, and an antibiotic uh, timeout. And then the reporting, they shifted from looking at costs to more looking at outcomes, looking at duration of therapy, looking at administration data, mortality, risk of resistance, and, and readmissions. Um, and so this has been sort of the shift from the early guidelines that were put out looking at just monitoring antimicrobial resistance to implementing and, and reviewing interventions that actually make a difference. So what role does the pharmacy department play in antimicrobial stewardship? So we have pharmacy directors, we have hospital pharmacists, and then we have antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists. And so I'll kind of at the end of this kind of identify which areas these pharmacists, leaders and these pharmacists uh, can have within antimicrobial stewardship within a hospital. And Dr. Chandra mentioned that we have clinical pharmacy um, services um, and in the US and specifically at the Detroit Medical Center, our clinical pharmacy program has been around since the 1980s. Uh, we had our postgraduate year one pharmacy residency, which is a general pharmacy residency after graduating from pharmacy school was introduced in the mid eighties. Uh, and our specific infectious disease postgraduate year two residency program was implemented in the early to mid nineties as well. So our program is, is, has a lot of history and has a lot of involvement from the pharmacists. And this involvement has grown over the, over the years um, um, since the, the early introduction of clinical pharmacists into the practice model at the hospital. So I want to focus on some specific interventions and areas where clinical pharmacy can have the biggest impact within antimicrobial stewardship. So these are the interventions that the guidelines from the IDSA recommend that we should implement. And so I want to focus on a few of them and talk about how our clinical pharmacy services can get involved and what kind of impact they can make. And so the ones I'm going to focus on are hospital pharmacy specific, such as IV to PO um, policies, dose optimization, dedicated pharmacy services for dosing uh, medications, prolonged infusions, and then talk about where ID trained antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists can have an impact with core interventions such as prospective audit and feedback and restricted policies with approvals, as well as moving on towards um, rapid diagnostics as well. So kind of the four areas we'll, we'll talk about is IV to PO, the prospective audit, kind of core interventions, dose optimization, and rapid diagnostics. So regarding um, using IV to PO as one of your first strategies in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, the guidelines recommend to implement this um, to identify patients that can safely complete therapy with an oral regimen in order to reduce the need for IV catheters or outpatient IV antibiotic use. And it's been shown that this can increase 
the use of antibiotics or the uh, IV to PO program can increase the use of oral antibiotics and can reduce length of stay and costs. And this is something that can be integrated into routine pharmacy activities. So this is a slide that looks at different um, hospitals that have implemented IV to PO programs and what kind of impact they have. And so one of this strategy um, in terms of IV to PO um, conversion is what we call low hanging fruit. It's something that can be initiated um, early on in an antimicrobial stewardship program, and it can involve hospital pharmacists. The, the program we have here at the Detroit Medical Center, we have an IV to PO policy. So any patient that is on certain antimicrobials that have high bioavailability, such as metronidazole, uh, fluoroquinolones, azithromycin, um, can actually be converted from IV therapy to oral therapy if the patient meets certain criteria without um, any communication to the physician. And so the pharmacists have a lot of independence to review the patient's charts to identify which patients can um, are tolerating other oral medications, are not having fevers, increased white count, um, are in the right situation where their um, gut is working so that they can get converted to PO therapy. And so a lot of studies have looked at, you know, what kind of impact this has. And one of the studies that is listed here is something that was done at the Detroit Medical Center in 2005. And this look was a prospective study that looked at pharmacy intervention to, uh, to convert patients from IV to PO um, moxifloxacin. And what we found, or what they found at that time, was that drug acquisition costs savings were $110 per patient. And so this was significant if you have quite a few patients that are getting uh, IV therapy. And this has been consistently shown with other studies that are listed here on the slide. Now, it's not always just about cost, and IV to PO programs definitely save uh, money in terms of drug acquisition costs, but they also have impact on patient care and some other outcomes. So I have a couple other studies listed here. And one study looked at patients with um, community-acquired pneumonia that were getting an IV cephalosporin. And they had a randomized trial where certain patients were randomized to either continue the IV therapy for seven days or to convert from IV um, cephalosporin to an oral cephalosporin uh, by day two. And what they found was that there was no difference in the actual duration of therapy overall. And there was no difference in how many patients had symptom improvement, but the length of stay decreased from nine, almost 10 days in patients that received IV therapy for the full course to seven days for those that received oral therapy. And so they, they concluded that a decreased length of stay can be achieved even if the duration of therapy is similar with an IV to PO program. This other study listed here looked at uh, an IV to PO program over three separate time periods. And they converted patients that were on IV antibiotics more than 24 hours. And so patients that were converted to oral antibiotics after 24 hours were less likely to have Lyme complications. So they had less IV uh, durations that decreased from four days to three um, days. And then they also were less likely to have Lyme complications. So the patients switched to oral therapy um, had um, significantly less or had less um, complications associated with the line. So this is another um, potential um, benefit of doing an IV to PO program utilizing um, hospital pharmacists um, that, are, that are using a standard criteria for converting patients over to oral therapy. Moving on to the um, kind of core strategies that antimicrobial stewardship is built off of, uh, prospective audit or restricted formulary. And so I wanted to talk about this because these are the core components of any stewardship program um, as per the guidelines. And we know that both strategies, whether it be prospective audit, where um, patients are able to, or prescribers are able to, to give any antibiotic with review after 48 to 72 hours by a clinical pharmacist, or a restricted formulary where you can um, have to consult either an ID physician or ID pharmacist in order to um, continue a certain particular um, antibiotic. And so we know both of these strategies can significantly reduce um, antibiotic use, cost, and resistance. And so I'm not going to go through each of these individual studies, but you know, I just wanted to point out that there are several studies looking at what kind of impact these interventions have. And so 
in these particular studies, most of them were looking at prospective audit and feedback and what kind of outcomes and what kind of benefits we would have in terms of antibiotic costs. And all of these studies showed a decrease in antibiotic expenditure from before the program was implemented to after when uh, the program was implemented. Now, again, cost is not the only thing that um, stewardship metrics should be based off of. And we've really been moving away from cost, um, cost metrics to more of outcome metrics. And some of these studies have also identified that these um, interventions can impact length of stay. And so several of these studies identified a shorter length of stay when these prospective audit and feedback programs were implemented. And so I didn't want to talk necessarily about the role of clinical pharmacy in these um, particular strategies because it's really well known that uh, prospective audit and feedback or restrictive policies can work. But I wanted to kind of talk about the role specifically of clinical pharmacists because some programs are built on um, just having ID consults for uh, antimicrobial approvals or having ID fellows um, responsible for for initiating or responsible for managing patients on certain antimicrobials. And so I wanted to just highlight this study um, that looked at the impact of a hospital-based antimicrobial program on clinical and economic outcomes. And what they did was they implemented an antimicrobial stewardship program and they had a clinical pharmacist that was responsible for um, doing restricted antibiotic approvals as well as um, prospectively evaluating these um, patients on specific medications. Um, and they had pharmacists doing that certain times of the day and during certain days of the week. And then ID fellows were doing it during the weekends and other times uh, of the day. And what they looked at was what was the impact or the comparison between the antimicrobial treatment managed by the stewardship program or what they coined as the antimicrobial management team versus the ID fellows. And so if you look at the number of patients that were treated and managed by the stewardship team versus the ID fellows, they found that there was a significant increase in the number of patients who were considered having appropriate antibiotic therapy when they were managed by the antimicrobial team. And they saw a significant improvement in clinical cure and less failures when the clinical pharmacist was managing those antibiotic approvals and those prospective audit and feedbacks. Now, there may be se several reasons why this occurs. You know, if you come to Detroit and you kind of spend time with our ID fellows, you'll know that they're quite busy handling a lot of complex patients and a lot of complex cases. And so they may not have as much time dedicated to reviewing these individual patients to determine whether the therapy is appropriate or not. Where if you have a dedicated clinical pharmacist doing these reviews, doing these um, approvals, they can spend the time to actually ensure that therapy is appropriate and patients aren't getting extended courses of therapy. So they also looked at cost um, and what was the reason why these, um, these, in the, these medications or these recommendations were, were not um, appropriate. And they found that the majority of the time, the ID fellows were, were allowing or keeping therapies that were too broad. And so, you know, with the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist, they were able to narrow therapy a little more than the ID fellows were willing to do in this particular case. And so it just sort of shows, you know, the impact that a dedicated clinical pharmacist and stewardship team can have within a health system. The other kind of novel area that I wanted to, to talk about in terms of these core antimicrobial stewardship um, interventions is using pharmacy residency, pharmacy residents. And so this was a study that um, we had published when I was in New York, and this was looking at how can we get our PGY2 pharmacy residents involved. And so the previous study, I mentioned that the ID fellows were covering antimicrobial um, stewardship um, um, responsibilities on the weekends, and they may not have been able to spend as much time because of you know, their regular clinical work. And so what we did was we utilized our PGY2 pharmacy residents in critical care and infectious diseases to expand our antimicrobial stewardship coverage into the weekends and saw what kind of impact it had and were they actually able to provide the same care and the same reviews that we did during the week. And so what we found was that the weekend coverage with the PGY2 pharmacy residents had even more interventions than we had um, during the weekday. And there could be several reasons for this. One of the reasons being that you have limited um, limited 
um, coverage on the weekdays. And so providers were more willing to reach out to the, to the pharmacy residents on the weekends for, for support. Um, and we didn't have all clinical farm. We didn't have clinical pharmacists rounding with the teams on the weekends, so there was more opportunities for interventions, as opposed to the ID stewardship pharmacists. But it just shows that these um, graduates or these postgraduates that are not um, full clinical um, full clinical stewardship pharmacists can still have an impact even uh, on the weekends. And so we also looked at you know they did antibiotic approvals as well, and they had similar requests on the weekends as we did during the week. And they provided the same number of interventions in terms of the same number of approvals, um, making therapy changes, making dose recommendations. And so they had a similar impact um, on the weekends as a trainee that we did um, during the week. And so even if you, know, you don't have a fully trained ID uh, clinical pharmacist, you can still have an impact within antimicrobial stewardship. So moving on to talk about other clinical roles that we can play as pharmacists, the guidelines recommend having um, pharmacokinetic monitoring programs for vanco and aminoglycosides as they can reduce cost and decrease adverse events. And they also recommend to consider dosing strategies for beta-lactams, which is starting to become more prevalent over the last 10 years um, in order to improve outcomes and reduce costs. So how can pharmacists get involved? Or, or does this involvement with pharmacists actually have a big impact? So one of the first studies that looked at pharmacist management of pharmacokinetic dosing with vanco and aminoglycosides, they looked at um, patients that had um, management with a pharmacist for dosing of aminoglycosides and vanco and those patients that did not. And they found that the overall cost when the patients were managed by a pharmacist had de was decreased um, the overall drug cost was decreased, and even the laboratory cost was decreased in this particular study. But more importantly, they found when pharmacists managed vanco and aminoglycoside dosing in this particular study that they showed that there was a, a, a shorter length of stay, uh, almost a full day, uh, or just over a full day, um, where these patients were able to get discharged faster. And they had less complications, such as hearing loss with aminoglycoside therapy, and then renal impairment with vanco and aminoglycosides. And so this shows, shows that pharmacy management of, of dosing um, with vanco and aminoglycosides can have an impact on patients as well. And so they even showed in this study that there was a, 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 a decrease in mortality in those patients with complications when they were managed by a pharmacist than those that weren't managed by a pharmacist. So it's not just cost, there are clinical implications for having pharmacists manage dosing of vanco and aminoglycosides. And I will say that at the Detroit Medical Center, we've been having clinical pharmacists um, dose and monitor vancomycin for quite a long time. And within the last five to 10 years, we've actually moved to an um, uh, area under the curve or AUC dosing uh, monitoring for, um, for vancomycin. And this is based on the new guidelines that came out from the ASHP IDSA and the and Society of Infectious Disease Pharmacists. And this therapeutic monitoring guideline is pushed in to recommend AUC dosing. And the reason for AUC dosing is because, you know, with a target AUC of 400 um, for staff aureus, we can see increased um, improvement in clinical outcomes. And, you know, when we used to do trough based dosing, we used to see targets of 12 to 15 in order to, to, to try to get adequate concentrations of the drug. But what we found is that those trough concentrations may actually be more than what is necessary. So in the, this particular study that was one of the first studies looking at AUC dosing, um, they identified that with trough level dosing, the troughs were generally higher, which was leading to higher AUCs. Whereas when AUC dosing was implemented at the Detroit Medical Center, we found that our trough levels were on average lower, which meant that our AUC dosing was lower as well. And so, you know, in all, in all fairness, does this actually make a difference um, when we're doing AUC dosing and using lower area under the curve or having um, lower concentrations that we're achieving? And it does make a difference. So it makes a big difference in terms of nephrotoxicity. And so this study also identified that when we moved over to AUC dosing, 
we saw a decrease in um, nephrotoxicity with Vanco. And so this is looking at patients that were monitored with trough monitoring versus those that were monitored with AUC. And so with AUC dosing, we're getting lower concentrations and we're getting, um, we're getting uh, less nephrotoxicity. And it's not just Vanco and aminoglycoside dosings where pharmacists can have an impact. It's also creating alternative dosing strategies for other uh, medications such as beta-lactams. So we do prolonged infusions of all beta-lactams here at the DMC. Um, cefepime is infused over three hours, miropenem and peptazo are all infused over three hours. And this, um, this study, which was published in 2011, looked at, um, this wasn't um, um, from DMC data, but this looks at the mortality for those patients that were getting extended infusion to Priscillin Casobactam versus those that were not. And, we, and they saw in this particular study that there was a, a decrease in mortality in patients that were getting extended infusion, um, piperacillin and tazobactam versus other beta-lactams. So this strategy and this involvement in dosing actually still ha has an impact in mortality as well. So moving on to the last role that I wanted to talk about or the last um, intervention um, with that stewardship pharmacists can get involved in is rapid diagnostics. And so the guidelines from 2016 recommended to utilize rapid diagnostics in order to um, assist clinicians in interpreting and responding to results. And what they specifically mention is that this should be combined with active ASP support and interpretation. So this um, study looked at the um, looked at the role of rapid diagnostics for di identifying staph aureus, whether it was MSSA or MRSA. And this first figure looked at the number of patients that were switched to appropriate therapy for MSSA and MRSA when the uh, rapid diagnostic PCR was introduced and before it was introduced. And they found that the number of patients that were switched to MSSA-directed therapy was higher in the post um, rapid diagnostic group. They also looked at what was the mean time to antibiotic switch. And they found that the mean time to switch was significantly shorter in those patients that were uh, had that rapid diagnostic or after that rapid diagnostic tool was implemented. And so the IDSA guidelines recommend introducing these rapid diagnostics with the help of a stewardship or clinical pharmacist. And so what we see is that sometimes when we implement these rapid diagnostic programs, it does decrease the time to identification of these organisms. Like in this particular study, they decrease the time of identification for MRSA and MSSA from two days to uh, uh, one day, um, but it may not always increase or improve the time to optimal antibiotic therapy. And so in this particular study that showed a, an improved time to identification of MRSA, they actually didn't find, pardon me, they didn't find a difference in the time to optimal antibiotic therapy. And so patients with MRSA or MSSA did not have an improved time to optimal antibiotic therapy. And the most likely reason for this is that they just implemented the rapid diagnostic without having anybody follow up on those results. And so clinicians may not have trusted the information or may not have been aware of that, that information or have been aware that informa information was available. And so this um, study looked at what is the impact of having stewardship involvement in rapid diagnostic reporting. And so what they found was that when the rapid diagnostic was introduced, the time to appropriate de-escalation did not change. So it was 34 hours in the before group, 38 hours in the after group. And that time to appropriate de-escalation didn't change significantly until stewardship became involved. And so that time to appropriate de-escalation decreased um, to 21 hours in this particular study. So it kind of reiterates the impact that clinical pharmacists can have or the stewardship program can have when you implement these, these rapid diagnostic programs. So now kind of moving on to what role can each of these um, members of the pharmacy team have? So I think Dr. Ravankar had mentioned that you need to have um, buy-in for antifungal stewardship um, from um, the higher-ups. And this is true for antimicrobial stewardship. So pharmacists, pharmacy directors 
can interact with hospital administrators, can commit to the antimicrobial stewardship program's mission by dedicating resources to the, to the antimicrobial stewardship team. Hospital pharmacists that aren't necessarily trained in infectious diseases can have impacts on IV to PO switches and policies, dose optimization for vancomycin and aminoglycoside, therapeutic monitoring and beta-lactam uh, dose um, recommendations. And then antimicrobial stewardship trained pharmacists can have big impacts by participating in those core stewardship metrics, by planning and implementing these strategies. Uh, I didn't really talk about assessing the um, practices and analyzing the uh, baseline data, collecting um, and reporting on how the stewardship program is, is having an impact and then disseminating those findings. And then last, overcome pushback from other clinicians and, and other specialties that may not be interested in listening to the stewardship pharmacist um, role. So the last slide I wanted to, to talk about was just the future of clinical pharmacy within ASP. Um, I think we need to move more from a cost uh, based metric uh, evaluation to look at uh, clinical outcomes. Uh, we're lucky in the United States that the, um, um, the uh, Medicare, Medicaid um, and Joint Commission, which standardizes our hospital practices, require antimicrobial stewardship in all hospitals. So now we don't have to justify by cost. We can look at our clinical outcomes in terms of mortality, length of stay, um, recurrence and resistance. We kind of need to go back to handshake antimicrobial stewardship, which is actually going back to the bedside, interacting with teams that are rounding um, on a regular basis, um, moving towards outpatient uh, antibiotic therapy, looking at stewardship in the long-term care um, facilities, nursing home facilities, getting other disciplines involved, such as nurses. And then as Dr. Rabunkar mentioned, antifungal stewardship is, is, becoming, is becoming more important as well. And so with that, I'd, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions um, that you may have and talk about our program experience here at the Detroit Medical Center and how we get all of our pharmacists involved and how our clinical pharmacists are, are involved in stewardship. Thanks, Marco. Thanks for the uh, nice presentation. And uh, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but that's okay. Uh, I am going to pick on uh, Kavita and Murali. Uh, uh, you don't hear clinical pharmacists giving talks in infectious disease conferences in India. Clinical pharmacy is non-existent in India. So the idea of introducing Marco was to make uh, the listeners here see the role clinical pharmacists could play in enhancing antimicrobial stewardship in the hospital setting and perhaps in the outpatient setting as well. This is a very new concept for India. So I hope the listeners, if there are administrators, uh, uh, begin to see what we have been doing here for over 40 years, as Marco pointed out. Uh, this is old stuff for us. And this needs implementation in India, particularly starting with large Indian medical schools that have pharmacy programs. Curriculum has to include clinical pharmacy. So we create the cadre of individuals that would function as clinical pharmacists serving an extraordinarily important function in the hospitals. So let me open it up. Kavita, uh, Morali, uh, do you have any questions specific, not for me, but for Marco? Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations. It was a brilliant lecture by Marco, uh, very impressive. Uh, to tell the status of uh, pharmacy in our hospital. We have a very dynamic pharmacy practice department in our institution with the uh, running PharmD program. So they have been doing research uh, and uh, they also have uh, consideration to start uh, people rounding with various departments especially as team leaders and a group of a uh, few individuals working with the different departments to give inputs. 
uh, I have had the privilege of working with uh, family people uh, since about 20 years. We used to have uh, some of the consultants who would come for rounds and uh, they would suggest uh, some uh, uh, dose adjustments in, in the rounds. Uh, however, there's a lot more to do in India, um, even with the res respect to uh, all of these antimicrobial stewardship from pharmacy section. Uh, also, in our department, we have antimicrobial stewardship uh, um, research going on with the Murlida Verma is a principal investigator, and we have a research assistant who is a family person uh, who is helping him with that antimicrobial stewardship. Yes, so the beginning has been done, but uh, there's a lot more things to be done. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks, Kavita. Morali, do you want to make any comments, Morali? Okay. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, uh, Marco Clinical Pharmacy is it's in its infancy, as you just heard. And do you have any words of advice to this group, Marco? Yeah, so um, before I give any words of advice, I, I do want to say, as I was, you know, preparing this presentation, I was, you know, doing some research on antimicrobial stewardship in India. And I have come across some um, papers and, and research to look at the impact that antimicrobial stewardship can have. So I think I agree it is it is there. The one word of wisdom is it's a slow process. I think the biggest, the biggest issue we had in the United States, and luckily this was before you know I you know had to had to come across this was creating dedicated time for the pharmacist to spend on on stewardship instead of asking a pharmacist that needs to verify and make medications and and do things within the pharmacy um, to provide dedicated time so that they can really focus on, on this important task. And the thing I kind of, I kind of walked through very quickly was cost, um, you know, before the stewardship programs were implemented country or countrywide, we had to justify our positions by cost and all stewardship programs will decrease antimicrobial use and cost and can be self, um, self financing, if you will. Um, and so once you cross that threshold and show that we can be, you know, able to, we're not an increased burden and increased cost to the system. We're actually providing, um, we're providing cost savings. And once you get over that hump and then you can start to show the other clinical impact, it was the, probably the biggest issue and hurdle that, that had to, that had to be overcome within the United States. And luckily that happened before I, you know, came along and I've been able to benefit from you know, being a part of the stewardship programs that didn't, that had that dedicated time. And so I think providing dedicated time, having the dedicated training will, will be a significant, um, will be a significant thing to have and having champions to, to promote this is, is very important. And that's a very right. good point uh, to note that it should make economic sense for the hospitals to have uh, this kind of uh, a clinical pharmacist because uh, at the end of the day uh, it's economics uh, you know so uh, it has to make economic sense to have uh, a pharmacist advising on these things of course uh, when when it comes to the cost of antimicrobials and the consequences it will make sense uh, so it's a way to go i agree well as marco pointed out in his lecture over and over it's just not the cost, it's the quality of care also substantially improves. That's an important point to note for us as clinicians. I okay, mean for the program go. directors to adopt, or the administrators to adopt, uh, they, will, uh, they will also see from the economic point of view. Absolutely I definitely right. agree. Okay, thank you, thank you, great. Thanks, Marco, thanks for your time. Uh, let's move okay, on no. to the let's move on to the next area. Um, uh, next one is uh, the speaker is Dr. Tina Chopra. Uh, could I have that introductory slide, please? Tina is a faculty in our group at uh, Wayne State University. Uh, 
in the Division of Infectious Diseases. And the topic that she has chosen to talk about is uh, stewardship in a pandemic situation. So this is very timely. Uh, as you all know, what's been happening with uh, SARS-CoV-2 that has turned the entire hospital care upside down. It's an incredible, I don't have to tell you, you probably are facing similar situation. Our rounding has changed. Hospital occupancy has changed. Emergency room has changed. So in the midst of all this, with the staggering volume that we have to deal with, we also have to practice stewardship. And as you all know, antimicrobials have skyrocketed in their use during the COVID times. And most of us realizing that secondary bacterial infections are uncommon, in spite of which the antimicrobial use has skyrocketed. I'm not sure why, I don't understand this. And the leading country for doing this in the entire world is India, where secondary antimicrobial use in the midst of COVID has skyrocketed, recognizing that the bacterial infections are not very frequent. However, so, so I think it's very appropriate to give us some advice on antimicrobial stewardship in the pandemic setting and how do we move forward so Dr. Tina is a professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and the Corporate Medical Director of Hospital Epidemiology, Infection Prevention and Stewardship at DMC, Wayne State University. Research interests include epidemiology of healthcare associated infections, infection prevention, stewardship and immunization, published over 80 papers in various journals and book chapters, independently reviewed over 60 articles, special interest in immunization, studying epidemiology of C. difficile and multidrug resistant organisms. She championed the mammoth task of leading COVID-19 pandemic for Wayne State University and the DMC. She serves on the Wayne State President's COVID Task Force and on the President's Public Health Committee. She's appeared on countless media and print interviews, including a variety of uh, outlets. Tina? Please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Chandra, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kavita, for having me. Um, it's been wonderful to be part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, you know, project. And I'm gonna share my slides um, now. I hope you can see them. So before I start, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, uh, Marco did an amazing job of describing the stewardship uh, program here in the US. I should also mention to you that this stewardship program is not equitable throughout the US. You know, I do stewardship both at an academic tertiary care center and a law facility. We have a lot of alternate healthcare centers, which are like community hospitals here, and they don't have such advanced, robust stewardship programs. So it's important to realize, like you were mentioning, Dr. Kavita, the economic um, uh, advantage and the eco economics around it are very important. And also the overall antibiotic use in the US will depend on not only the hospital antibiotic use, but also in the community and also in these alternate healthcare facilities. So it's important to remember that. And also with this, um, uh, I would like to say that when we have uh, pandemics and uh, uh, emergent situations like, uh, like this pandemic, which no one has ever seen, what do we do with stewardship? What do, what do we do with all these advanced programs we have in place? How do we follow them? How do we follow all these policies? Do, do we have any um, guidebook or do we have any evidence? And do we have any knowledge about um, resuscitating during um, resuscitating stewardship during the time of pandemic? So that's what we're gonna to learn today. These are my disclosures. So let me start off like Dr. Chandra pointed out, I mean, throughout the globe, antibiotic use um, was all over the place, you know. Um, the antibiotics like azithromycin were being, uh, you know, used like candy and um, everybody um, was not aware of the fact that these patients um, 
Um, are they coming in with the bacterial infection on top of COVID? Uh, the, their presentation was very, very unique. There was a concern for bacterial super infection. There, it was very hard to distinguish COVID-19 from community acquired pneumonia early on when we were seeing a surge of patients. Um, and azithromycin uh, use was much, much higher than ex expected, you know, especially where we were seeing higher COVID numbers. So um, this was really the azithromycin use was a marker for a, a reflection of its early promotion, you know, throughout. And, um, uh, you know, we, we saw it in our center as well. We saw it uh, in whether we were advanced uh, in terms of stewardship or we were behind. Um, we saw a lot of antibiotic use. And when we have antibiotic use, we see more C. diff infections, right? Uh, we see the consequences, the parallel pandemic of antibiotic use in the form of, uh, you know, emergence of multidrug resistant uh, pathogens, um, more, uh, more C. diff, more C. diff and COVID co-infections, which were also reported by our center. And uh, we know that these multidrug resistant infections are very, very difficult to treat and they add on to the morbidity and mortality. So uh, WHO actually came up with uh, infection, uh, you know, recommendations, wonderful recommendations for acute co-infections with bacteria. And they dogmatically recommended against using of antibiotic therapy or prophylaxis for patients with suspected or confirmed mild COVID-19. So this was like a guidebook, what WHO, of course, later on, uh, but definitely a lesson learned for future pandemics and for, for other surges that we are seeing, you know, for third and fourth surges. So these are those, some of those recommendations. Uh, they, they recommend antibiotics should not be prescribed for patients with suspected or confirmed moderate COVID-19 until there is clinical suspicion of bacterial infection. For mild, not at all. But for moderate, they said use empiric antibiotics to treat likely pathogens based on clinical judgment. So code blue of stewardship, resuscitating stewardship during these pandemics means Basically, you use clinical judgment. You want to use some objective uh, criteria like CT scans. Is the CT scan looking like COVID? We all have seen so much of COVID now that we know how what to look for in the CT scan. Is this a uh, infiltrate uh, that could be caused by a bacterial pneumonia or is this a viral uh, infiltrate? You know, so uh, using your clinical acumen is uh, going to be extremely, extremely critical during these times. And that's the education we want to give to our, uh, uh, you know, trainees that you want to always use clinical uh, judgment. It should be higher than any kind of uh, any kind of uh, tests or anything else that you are suspecting during these times. Uh, you want to look at patient host factors, and you also want to look at uh, local epidemiology with suspected or uh, confirmed severe COVID. And this has this assessment has to be done very early on, within one hour. Um, I, ideally, with blood cultures being obtained at first, you want to make sure you have all your uh, uh, you are using all your tools in your toolbox. And early and appropriate empiric therapy can be admin, administered in the ER, which we all do, uh, you know, when we are suspecting a bacterial infection and the duration of antibiotics should be as short as possible, generally five, five days or so. So all of these are pearls for antibiotic stewardship during uh, such emergent situations. First of all, if it is a mild to moderate illness, you don't want to use any prophylaxis or empiric therapy. If you are suspecting severe COVID with a bacterial infection uh, using your clinical judgment, you want to draw blood cultures at first and you want to use the shortest duration possible. Um, you want to assess your patients every day for de-escalation. De-escalation, like Marco pointed out, is one of the methods for stewardship. So every day you want to see if you can de-escalate. You want to also see if you can switch from IV to oral. Uh, what are the other circumstances you want to consider empiric therapy? You know, we um, saw very high COVID mortality amongst nursing home patients, which were older than 65 years of age because of immunosenescence. And the fact that they may not mount up an immune response uh, of fever and um, typical bacterial, um, uh, you know, pneumonia. So in such patients, you can consider empiric um, antibiotic therapy. 
Uh, also in children less than five years of age, you could consider empiric therapy. Uh, you want to continue your stewardship programs uninterrupted amongst COVID-19 patients. And these are all WHO recommendations. Uh, remember, distinguishing between viral and bacterial co-infections is very important. So you don't want to overuse antibiotics. Um, you have several other signs and symptoms of COVID that we are aware of, including anosmia, which, um, you know, loss of taste and loss of smell, smell which are quite um, typical of COVID-19 and other hallmarks like, you know, persistent cough, diarrhea, abdominal pain can also help. What about C-reactive protein and procalcitonin? They haven't been proven helpful at discriminating patients presenting with COVID-19 uh, or bacterial in, uh, infections, but they may prove some value in disease severity and predicting prognosis. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think it goes without saying how increased antibiotic use has led to the challenge of higher morbidity, mortality, uh, you know, increasing re resistance will be, if, if this continues the way we are using antibiotics by 2050, you know, it can lead to death of 10 million people and costs, huge costs, $100 trillion uh, to the U.S. Um, also, um, these patients, and I'll show you some of the data, are more likely to get uh, resistant infections like CREs and NDMs. Our NDM rates um, doubled during the pandemic. Our MDR pseudomonas rates uh, went up as well. So, um, you know, the, the one of the main recommendations uh, is that you want to optimize antibiotic use uh, by ensuring appropriate is antibiotics are given in the correct dose and correct duration as well, because all of these things can help eventually with decreasing antibiotic resistance. Um, what are the potential threats that could affect stewardship activities during pandemics? You know, one of the one of these the threats are that many individuals presenting with mild disease without pneumonia or moderate disease with pneumonia they receive antibiotics. And we have some data, there was a study conducted in January 2020 in an adult infectious disease unit in China. They found that 71% of patients hospitalized for COVID-19 had received antibiotics, despite a confirmed bacterial co-infection rate of only 1%. So, uh, and we saw what happened with azithromycin. You know, it was widely used with hydroxychloroquine and it was not really, there was not evidence around it, its use. Um, I also want to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, Detroit, what happened in Detroit. You know, we, we in general, we know that because of antibiotic resistance, more than 35,000 individuals die annually. And the problem of the pandemic obviously increased, escalated this. Uh, but in the background, we were also facing other, other, other challenges. We were um, we didn't have rapid diagnostic tests for COVID. We didn't have an in-house rapid diagnostic test. We were sending all our samples to the state, which was taking a lot of time. So we weren't actually able to practice stewardship in the beginning. Uh, like Marco pointed out, the importance of rapid diagnostics is so critical, particularly during these pandemics. And we've seen even in the past with the flu pandemic, uh, we need rapid diagnostic tests and we need them at our disposal disposal in-house, not uh, a send out test. So um, we, what we did was, uh, of course, this is a, this is a, retrospectively, we wanted to understand our object, uh, antibiotic use during the pandemic. And then we did a sub-analysis within the COVID-19 cohort uh, based on their SARS-CoV-2 status. So this is, a, this is antimicrobial use in about, um, as you can see, about overall 6,000 patients uh, in Detroit, Michigan, uh, we divided them into two categories, um, uh, PUI positive and negative. So PUI are patient under investigations that we are suspecting COVID. And the first column here is non-PUI patients, which means that these patients, um, we did not suspect COVID in them. And they were about 4,700 4, 4, patients. And in 1,500, they were PUI negative, And 1,000 of them were PUI positive. And these are uh, basically their demographics, predominantly African-American population, you know, and their median age was about 59 to 60 years of age. And then we look at the mortality. I mean, patients who were PUI positive, 34% uh, of them expired. Patients who were 
So the, the patients who expired amongst PUI positive were 34%, who were negative were about 10%, and who were non-PUI were 4.7%. Uh, to remind you, PUI, some of these PUI negative patients may have been actually COVID positive just because, you know, we could have a false negative, 30% false negative COVID test in them. The length of stay of patients that were um, COVID positive was about median of nine days compared to seven uh, days in PUI negative and six days in non-PUI patients. And then we looked at uh, top three antibiotics prescribed, you know, cefepime, ceftriaxone and doxycycline. So look at their differences between PUI positive, about uh, 40% received cefepime, 60% uh, ceftriaxone, 60% and 52% um, doxycycline compared to those that were PUI negative, 32% got cefepime, 37 ceftriaxone and 25 uh, doxycycline, and then way uh, lower numbers for non-PUI patients. So very interesting data. Um, and this was uh, just during the first surge of COVID in 2020. Um, but, hold on, I can't. Uh, so more interesting than this data is how are antimicrobial prescribing varied during the surge? So this basically shows just uh, antibiotics during um, March, April, and May 2020, March is when we were seeing our surges, you know, March and April were peak surges. Um, and, um, you know, this is just in the PUI positive cohort. So the SARS-CoV-2 positive patients. So antimicrobial prescribing was uh, almost 63% in March, and then it fell down to 42% and 29% uh, in May. So you, why did this happen? You know, we have a very advanced stewardship program at our tertiary care hospital in Detroit, like Marco uh, beautifully pointed out, but why, why was our antibiotic use so high? You know, there were several reasons. One of the reasons was we didn't know what uh, we are doing, you know, with these patients because uh, they were coming in with this such mixed picture um, and we had no rapid diagnostic tests in our hospital. So while they were waiting for the COVID test to come back, we were giving them antibiotics um, as a defense mechanism to try to save them in whichever possible way. They were so sick. Some of them were older. Most of them were older patients. They were dying right and left. And, um, you know, we didn't think it was uh, antibiotics are going to hurt them in any way. And we were giving antibiotics, lots and lots of antibiotics. Um, so that is where you want to use your cl clinical acumen, WHO guidelines, divide these patients into mild, moderate, severe, and then determine which patients warrant antibiotics for the shortest period of time, um, um, maximum five to seven days, assessing them for de-escalation every single day, assessing them for switch from IV to oral every single day. Um, so what are the factors, uh, you know, that uh, affect antibiotic use and, and resistance during the COVID pandemic? You know, about 70% of hospitalized COVID patients receive antibiotics. Often these are empiric broad spectrum and 16% of hospitalized COVID patients develop a secondary bacterial infection, only 16%, but 70% receive antibiotics. Uh, also, the other important challenge is difficulties in assessing the advice from experts before prescribing antimicrobial agents. You know, there are, uh, remember, there is, uh, the whole system is overwhelmed. I mean, um, uh, there are so many patients that you can't uh, consult an ID a physician on every single patient. Um, and so the stewardship efforts can be undermined because of higher workloads, shifting priorities, um, you know, uh, the staff is getting sick with COVID as well. So all of these things, uh, you know, can be very, very challenging. Um, and uh, sometimes because of the pandemics, there can be shortages of antibiotics, uh, shortage, shortages of uh, uh, important equipment and, um, and certain narrow spectrum antibiotic agents can We, we lost you, Tina. Can't hear you. 
Kavita, can you hear Tina? Uh, no, Chandra, we just lost her, I think. We can wait. We are trying to find out. She's got <clears throat> locked out. Yeah, she got logged out. Oh. She has to re-log in, right? Yes, Okay, so while she's relogging, let's continue the conversation. Um, let's talk about stewardship uh, during pandemic uh, at your institutions. Um, uh, you saw Tina presenting the data about 70% excess antibiotic use uh, among our COVID patients at our institution. And most of them were uh, for a presumed bacterial respiratory infection. And therefore the antibiotics most commonly used here include azithromycin, ceftriaxone, and doxycycline, and cefepime as well. So these are the three or four antibiotics we were most commonly using in excess. Um, and then until there were more data that came out showing that bacterial infections after all are not that common in the COVID setting. So stewardship stepped in and came out with some criteria as to when we could use empirically antibacterials in the COVID setting and when we could hold back empiric antibacterials. Uh, after doing that, our uh, empiric antimicrobial use, I must say, I don't know the numbers, Tina will have the numbers, uh, had decreased with the stewardship stepping in. Um, do you want to share your experience, uh, Kavita or Murali? Yeah, Chandra. So um, in India, the dynamics was slightly different. Uh, there was a good lag, fortunately for us. Uh, in India, uh, the, it started in March. Uh, by third week of March, uh, there was a national lockdown. So because of that, we all got a good amount of one month in the preparation. And by that time, the COVID was ravaging in Spain and the US. And we got to learn a lot from that experience. So we could really understand and uh, some literature was already available by the time we got COVID. Uh, so even in our own institution, we had three cases uh, to begin with, then there was no cases for one month because of the lockdown. So we had enough time uh, to understand and try to formulate some guidelines, local guidelines, though there was no national guidelines at then. And uh, the Department of Infectious Disease was responsible. So we started managing all the cases and uh, the leading the team of management. So we were very restrictive about antibiotic use. So uh, though there was even recommendation from the uh, governments about azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, I'm very proud to say that we did not use hydroxychloroquine and almost azithromycin. So uh, yes, it was a very good uh, thing in our institution. The antimicrobial usage was very less. Uh, of course, when uh, the, as Tina pointed out rightly, uh, when uh, we were overwhelmed, definitely ID was not consulted. And at that time, definitely there was uh, some increase in antibiotic utilization. Uh, of course, when the patients are severe, we do not, uh, at least there will be empiric use of uh, antibiotics until uh, the secondary infections are ruled out. Yes, yeah, so we had kind of control, but in the community, I can say that uh, it went quite out of control with respect to azithromycin, and also steroids. And you know the consequence, what happened later. The yes. mucormycosis, uh, India saw mucormycosis like no other country did. And it's all because of the unrestricted and, uh, you know, 
uh, rampant use of steroids. Yeah, absolutely right. I think goes back to um, uh, ID physicians who are limited in number in India have to take the responsibility of educating general practitioners and primary care physicians uh, how not to use empiric antibiotics, how not to use corticosteroids inappropriately. Otherwise, the price we pay is huge. And I think it is ID physicians' responsibility. Okay, I think Tina is back on the line. Go ahead, Tina. Sorry. Yes, thank I'm you. Glad you're thank back. you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so I was uh, talking about infection control challenges that uh, the staff was also facing with lack of PPE and um, you know staff staff shortages that we were also uh, facing. In addition to that, you know many other things can lead to antibiotic resistance, like increased use of sanitizer or the biocidal agents uh, that are used. You know likely increased use of antibiotic use in nursing homes, uh, self-medication that you all were talking about. So, you know, uh, these are all consequences of um, pandemics in general. The parallel pandemic of resistance is going to continue for several years, you know. Um, um, uh, it's already, we, we were already in the post-antibiotic era and now the pandemic is like a fuel to, to the fire. Uh, you know, many, um, um, some they can be factors that could actually decrease resistance too during pandemics because remember there were no surgeries going on during surges so fewer antibiotic uh, you, you courses for prophylaxis were being given and uh, fewer emergency and planned um, you know uh, hospital admissions people were not coming to hospitals for other other reasons as well. Um, and obviously we were all masking and we are all masking and we, we are being overtly cautious. Um, and, uh, you know, other, all of these things can actually decrease antimicrobial use theoretically. Um, we were, uh, um, in addition to that, you know, uh, like I said, uh, less transfers from other hospitals were also like long-term care facilities uh, was also noticed and um, pa patients were mostly uh, cohorted in single units and cared for, for by same healthcare workers. So all of these factors could actually de decrease based on a lot of evidence that we have seen. People should ideally be more aware of differences between viruses and bacteria. Uh, you know, uh, there is less respiratory tract infections because of less because of lockdowns, which would which should also decrease uh, theoretically decrease antimicrobial use. Uh, and in general, you know, less cross-border spread, uh, increased hygienic practices in the community um, can all actually decrease antimicrobial use. Um, so uh, what are the measures? I think we discussed some of these me measures to address antimicrobial resistance. Uh, you know, you want to have targeted training for uh, healthcare workers, uh, you know, to increase their competence. You want to give them more, empower them to uh, have a higher clinical acumen, when to de-escalate, when to switch from IV to oral, uh, evaluating the need for medical devices. Does my patient need a line? Does my patient need a Foley catheter? Because all of these are going to cause infections and we are going to use more antibiotics. Strict infection control measures in the hospital and making sure during pandemics we are ready for the surges with all the equipment we need, including PPE. So all of these things, uh, how can we continue essential health services and quality care to our patients during pandemics to and avoid, uh, you know, shortages of uh, various resources? And, uh, you know, even though U.S. is very, very developed country, but um, we were not ready. You know, there was a, uh, our in infrastructure in general was broken, uh, particularly in underserved communities like Detroit. We were not at all ready to deal with the magnitude of this pandemic. And uh, in general, uh, addressing gaps in stewardship activities, like uh, the biggest, biggest rate limiting factor was our rapid diagnostic tests. You know, I was desperately uh, calling companies to get send us some uh, kits so we can uh, test our patients. Uh, and the desperation was real uh, because we were sending our samples to the state, like I mentioned, and it took them a week sometimes. At a point of time, I sent 1,000 samples to the state and they returned all of them back to us because they were out of kits to test. So you can believe this happening here in the U.S. Um, just because our infrastructure was broken. 
So I would like to just summarize and give one message here that antibiotics don't work against COVID-19, but stewardship does. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to the good old days where uh, medical school, what we've learned in medical school, I did my medical school in India. And one thing that I learned there was your clinical acumen. You'd, we didn't have any rapid diagnostic tests to test our patients, but we did have that clinical knowledge to uh, understand if this is a viral infection or not. And going back to the basics is going to help us uh, during this time. Um, and remembering those principles of stewardship, I, I would like to stop here. And again, I want to really thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra and Dr. Kavita for uh, having me. It is a, it's a huge honor. Great. Thanks, Tina. Thank you so much uh, for the nice overview. Uh, it's a very pertinent, timely topic, uh, any, any country, anywhere around. Uh, I don't see any question and answer in the Q&A area. Um, we'll open it up. Um, uh, Kavita, do you have any comments or questions uh, for Tina? at this point uh, on this particular area uh, or your own experiences at your center and the neighboring centers? Uh, there is a question, uh, Chandra, in, uh, in the chat box. So okay. I, I just called Go ahead. It, uh, written, we found a good bit of bacterial infections in COVID patients who received baricitinib or tocilizumab. Any specific recommendation he wants to know? Go ahead, Tina. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, we there is we haven't looked at that data yet with bacterial co-infections in these patients, um, you know, who are specifically on uh, TOSI or Barry. But yes, I can tell you that a lot of these patients who are severe, have severe COVID, and they have been in the hospital for a long period of time. And all of those factors, and they have multiple devices, you know, ventilators and uh, lines and Foley catheters, all of which uh, are risk factors for uh, multi-drug resistant infections. So these are the patients that warrant um, empiric antibiotic therapy. And of course, these uh, monoclonals can also, uh, you know, uh, affect their immunity uh, further. The organisms that we have isolated in these patients, which is the next question, is predominantly your CREs, multi-drug resistant uh, acinetobacter and pseudomonas, which are very, very common in these patients. In fact, we did present some of this data at ID Week this year. And, um, you know, based on all these risk factors, you want to use broad spectrum antibiotics on them because they have the typical risk factors for a multi drug resistant organisms. So we have uh, seen that here as well and have used, have had to use these broad spectrum antibiotics because these MDROs will further add on to their uh, morbidity and mortality. I just want to add to what Tina just mentioned. Uh, remember, these are very potent immunomodulating drugs. And when these patients have super infections, it is generally recommended not to use these drugs in COVID patients who have super infections with bacterial organisms or fungal organisms, because the outcome from these infections, as they're exposed to anti-IL-6 and other such agents, is usually pretty bad. So the general recommendation would be not to use immunomodulators in patients who have super infections uh, with COVID infection. Please remember that. And, uh, and organisms, as you would expect, are usually hospital organisms because they've been around for a while in the hospital. Okay, uh, good. That's a very important point to emphasize. Uh, uh, Kavita, anything else you want to bring up? There is another question. How did you deal with difficulty in hand hygiene with universal gloving in COVID ICU? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we, um, in, the, in the COVID ICU, we didn't do universal gloving like all the times. We um, used uh, gloves, gowns, and masks when we entered patient rooms. Um, and uh, before you, you do that, you want to wash your hands. So the first step of, uh, you know, uh, donning uh, PPE for uh, COVID is you wash your hands. So you wash your hands and then you glove is the, is the sequence of, uh, you know, the way you don uh, your PPE. 
So um, we, in between patients, we remove the gloves, again, wash our hands and then go on to the next patient. So that is uh, obviously takes a lot of time, but uh, you know, every time when Ebola happened, uh, we did a lot of education uh, in our, among our staff around COVID uh, uh, precaution, about, around PPE, donning and doffing. And I think this has to go on uh, all the time. The, the training, the in-servicing of staff around donning and doffing has to go on all the time in between pandemics as well. Uh, so they are, they are, they are, they have the habit of doing it. So uh, that's what we do here. We don't do universal gloving all the time. Uh, Kavita, how 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 um, freely available was the PPE in uh, various institutes? I'm sure there was a severe shortage, and you had to improvise. Uh, you want to comment on that? Uh, as I said, uh, we got a good amount of time. So uh, at least uh, in this part, we did not have shortage of PPEs. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, encouragement for the local make. So a lot of uh, encouragement and uh, small scale uh, industry kind of uh, people, uh, uh, they, they took up the job of uh, manufacturing PPEs. So I really should say that uh, we didn't have shortage. Of course, there was a big threat of shortage of masks. We were worried uh, looking at other areas. Uh, surely we were worried, but we did not have shortage. Uh, I can say that we did not have shortage of masks. We did not have shortage of PPEs. And uh, I'm very happy to say that we did not have healthcare worker mortality uh, here. So in the entire district of Udupi, uh, we did not have any healthcare worker mortality in COVID-19. So I think it's all because of the PPE. So the use, uh, availability of PPE, that made a lot of difference. Very good, very good. Well, there is somebody named Monica, Tina, I don't know if you can read the chat box. There's yes, a question yes, I... for you. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question is if there is a hand rub over the gloved hands, uh, you know, if you can recommend uh, that So when there is no, yeah, I would not recommend hand rubbing over the uh, gloved hands. There is no evidence around it that it works. And, uh, you know, the, the, in fact, it can may, it may do more harm than uh, working. So I would not recommend hand rubs over the glove, uh, gloved hands. I would uh, rather wash my hands, glove them, and change the gloves in between seeing patients. That's what uh, is a recommended practice. Okay. Um, so now um, I don't see any other questions, so let's keep chatting. Now we have influenza here, Kavita. We have a, what they call the twindemic, right, Tina? Uh, it, it's several cases have been reported. It's the influenza season for us. And uh, this is COVID on top of influenza. Just uh, in this area, there have been several hundred cases already reported. So we don't know who has COVID, who has influenza, who has both, or who has RSV. So it's become a challenge. Uh, so we our testing modalities have also changed to include all common pathogens. Tina, do you want to comment on this? Sure. Uh, so like Dr. Chandra pointed out, we have the fourplex uh, rapid diagnostic uh, PCR that we are using where we are testing for influenza A, B, RSV, as well as COVID. Um, you know, we have seen a huge outbreak of influenza A, H3N2 in one of our universities here. We had 500 cases of uh, influenza A and, um, you know, just community transmission and also the fact that people have stopped masking. You know, there was a time last year when we did not see a single case of influenza and our strep infections went down, our RSV infections went down, but all of that reversed this year because um, people are just not masking, you know, uh, the, the, of course, we, uh, the, there is vaccination as well, but um, we still have people who are unvaccinated against influenza and against COVID. Uh, so we are facing this twindemic and uh, that's why it is, uh, their uh, symptoms are, it's blurry, everything is blurry. So we have to test for everything. Uh, 
we also saw a huge surge of uh, RSV in adult patients, not only in children, but also in adults this year because um, of the fact that other viruses are now uh, have gone up. Uh, so that is a concern as well. And uh, I'm sure other uh, countries are also going to see a very similar trend moving forward as the weather is changing. In India, I don't think so. Everyone tests for uh, other influencers. So that is one we do not see because we do not test. Uh, in this hospital, yes, the testing for influenza this year was much less because of the COVID. Everyone was testing for COVID and the testing for influenza went down. Uh, when we have tested, we have found that H3N2 was more than H1N1. So there was a change uh, with respect to influenza. It was H3N2, but I'm sure we are seeing 100 of what is probably present. And but what is making a difference? Probably masking is making a difference. Absolutely. The vaccination yeah. is not great. Like the uptake of vaccination is not uh, at not uh, you know to a significant degree. I can say that. Uh, is how, how good right? is? Sorry, go ahead, Tina. Sorry, I was I was going to ask you if you. Uh, you give influenza vaccination in India because uh, that is a big factor as well in India that, you know, you, uh, I don't see a lot of uptake of influenza vaccination there. Yeah, we, very few people practice adult vaccination, adult immunization. It's a cost con uh, consideration most of the times. So, yeah, so in the very high risk individuals, uh, definitely it's uh, advised, but the uptake is much less, I can say that. Hopefully, uh, COVID increases the awareness of importance of adult vaccination in India. India is the world's leader in vaccine production. They are the number one vaccine producers, and yet the adults are deprived of all adult vaccines. This, again, I think is a job for the infectious disease physicians to be aware of the lack of adult vaccination rates or the poor adult vaccination rates, and hopefully COVID vaccine may serve as an impetus to improve vaccination rates against other infections as well. Yes, uh, that will definitely make sense to the public. Yeah, I think uh, Ram, Ram Subramaniam has an adult immunization clinic, right, in Madras. And like that, there should be several adult immunizations, at least in large university hospitals. Yes, we do have, but in general, the cost uh, constraints, out-of-pocket expenditure, that is, uh, the, is a factor because uh, pneumococcal vaccines are expensive. Very good. Well, it's 9.15. I, 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 uh, let's see, somebody has said vaccine is luxury in India. Of course, yeah, it is a luxury. Yeah, but when when you can use cefepim and ceftriaxone and piperacil and tazobactam, I think vaccine by uh, Ready Labs is a few cents. Please remember that it's all a matter of priority. Priority. We don't really fully realize the value of vaccines. We realize it in children, but we do not realize it in the adult population and pneumococcus continues to be the captain of death in the elderly. Okay, uh, any, any final thoughts, Tina, and then Kavita, and then we'll close. Tina? I, I, I think my final thoughts are basically the fact that, um, you know, community, and not only hospital-acquired stewardship is important, but also community stewardship, antibiotic stewardship in the community is extremely important, particularly in underserved areas, and we are struggling with it. And I'm sure in India, you know, it's in an, its uh, infancy. And that is something I would urge you to think about, you know, uh, moving forward to have a broader sort of uh, concept of stewardship, because I know that in the community, it is so easy to uh, uh, buy antibiotics from the pharmacy and just pop it like a pill. So um, that is my final message. And again, thank you so much for having me. Kavita, any closing comments? Uh, I, we would like to play a video before I give my final comments. Say, say that again, I'm sorry. Uh, 
I would like to play a video uh, thanking our okay. sponsors of the event. And uh, we have an ID program and uh, DM infectious diseases in our department. We would like um, eligible candidates to apply through NEET, a common entrance examination, super specialty entrance examination in India for DM infectious diseases. And uh, eligible candidates can join our program. So I wanted to show a video about our facility and also I represent Clinical Infectious Disease Society of India and I would like uh, people who are interested in India to become members of Clinical Infectious Disease Society. We have online registration, online membership is possible. Thank you for the excellent work you guys are doing and wish you all the very best. So it was about our sponsors who have helped in putting up this program for a week. Tomorrow we have a competitions for students about a debate on antimicrobial stewardship, a slogan writing competition uh, and a similar other competition amongst uh, students to be involved with the antimicrobial week. And also we are involved with Going Blue campaign uh, to raise awareness about antimicrobial stewardship and our institution campus will be lit up in blue on 24th of November. As individuals, we are uh, dressing in blue uh, whenever and whoever is interested uh, in solidarity about, uh, for antimicrobial resistance. And I'm very uh, thankful to faculty from Bay State University for uh, joining uh, and giving such wonderful lectures. And our program and viewers are enriched because of your experience. And this is not the last time, definitely I can say that. I'm very interested to have continuing collaboration and uh, a learning experience uh, in future. I'm very thankful to all three speakers and uh, Dr. Chandra for coordinating uh, with all of them. Thank you very much. And I also thank the participants uh, who have been viewing our program uh, online. Uh, thank you very much and continue to attend our programs uh, the subsequent days in this coming week. At the end, uh, I would request the panelists to stay back for a photograph, if you can switch on the videos, uh, all of you. All the panelists for the photograph, please. Uh, I don't know if uh, Sanjay is in or not. Is Sanjay still there? I'm very glad and we will reach out to you uh, in future. Marco, Tina, Sanjay and Chandra. So this is going to be Anytime. a time. Anytime. Long you guys time. are doing, uh, I'm, I'm very glad what Manipal Medical School is doing in that part of India, uh, infection is always neglected and ignored. Uh, you are pioneers in this area, promoting the awareness of infection and educating young, uh, younger physicians, motivated and becoming infectious disease physicians, recognizing there is not that much money in the field, nevertheless out of interest. Uh, so you guys should be applauded for what you guys are doing. And whatever we can do from Wayne State, we'll be happy to do it, to promote this. <clears throat> so is the picture taken or what's going on? Yes, taken. And I, I welcome all of you to India. Tina, you're welcome. And Marco, I don't know if you've visited India ever. Marco, you no, should go I with me. I would love to go. And yeah. Sanjay. The next meeting would be in Manipal uh, yes. live. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. As long as travel restrictions are out, I'm okay. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, guys, we'll see you later. Thanks Thank for you. putting it all together. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Somebody's asking for email. <laughs>